Hello gamers, Epic here. And in this video today, we're going to be doing something that I've never done before, so rightfully so, this should be a massive shit show. Today, we're going to be taking a look at the Borderlands Iceberg and try our best to break it down as good as we possibly can. I composed this iceberg because I haven't really seen anyone do an iceberg on this scale for Borderlands and there is definitely a lot of crazy shit that people forgot about or some people just like might know about but it's not as big as they might think. But beforehand, let's break down just what is an iceberg and talk about how we're going to be digesting ours. An iceberg list is essentially a tier list of knowledge within the community about events or myths and rumours which happened at some point which people may or may not know about. So for example, something lesser known like Nine Toes, who has three balls should be at the top of the iceberg because many people know about it. But something like Tina being Krieg's dad should be Wait, no. Something like Krieg being Tina's dad might be a little bit below the iceberg. We're going to be doing our iceberg on a severity scale, starting off at normal Vault Hunter mode and then going all the way up to OP 100. Yes, that's right, boys. We're bringing back OP levels for this one. So strap in because, boy, is this going to be messy. And it's also probably going to be the longest video I've ever done as well. So strap in, do some farming, listen along. It's going to be like a like a big old podcast. We're doing it. Here we go. So starting off in normal Vault Hunter mode, this is the least severe of the iceberg. This is stuff that pretty much everyone knows about. And we're going to start off with Sledge's shotgun launching. I'm sure everyone knows what this is. It's where you take the Sledge's shotgun from BL1 and sometimes BL2. And then you get your friends to jump. You'd aim at them. Bang, 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 and they'd go flying. Just a, just a pretty nice, wholesome memory. I'm sure everyone's done this with their friends. You've all argued who's getting launched. You've all done the one, two, three jump, and then wapam, just straight to Uranus. That's it. So I thought we'd open the list off with something as simple as the Sledge Shotgun launch. I thought it was pretty cool. Holy shit, there's a lot here. I need to go quick. Okay, next up, Moxie's Panties. Don't lie to me, you little kumos. Every single one of you who have played Borderlands 2 has looked at Moxie's Panties. I'm not spending long on this one, and honestly, I didn't at the time either. So, we're just gonna leave it at that moxie's panties we all know what it is it was a glitch let's move on we mentioned it at the start of the video nine toes it's a bandit that has three balls and and spikes for nipples why am i not surprised this this is this is uh, moving on the evil smasher glitch i did consider putting this one on the tip of the iceberg however i'm pretty sure due to how mainstream it went on youtube everyone really knows what the evil smasher glitch was in a nutshell there was a glitch with a unique gun called the evil smasher in borderlands 2 where you could stack damage on it a bunch of times to make yourself do a ton of damage and gearbox eventually patched it which led to me trying it for hours on end with no results so i cried after that but the Evil Smasher glitch is a part of Borderlands history and I'm sure a lot of people remember it as well. Next up is the Crawl Edge glitch. I'm sure everyone again knows about this. It is one of the most iconic glitches in Borderlands history. It still works today. It's the only way to kill Crawl because Crawl is a terrible boss and you cannot fight me on that reddit. Just a, another really wholesome memory. Don't worry it's gonna get a lot shittier later on but for now just just wholesome memories. Speaking of which, TK Baha are dying. This one honestly should probably go lower down the list. TK Baja has died more times in this franchise than I can recall. I don't know how he keeps coming back from the dead. He dies in the most peculiar ways and somehow still keeps coming back as a zombie for brains. It would not surprise me if he came back in Borderlands 4. TK Baja dying uh, honestly should be at the tip of the iceberg. Next up, we got the B conference call. Another memory from the opening of Borderlands 2 here. B conference call. Is your wife leaving you? B conference call. Homeless, need a house? B conference call. Can't make million dollars? Well, you can make it in 10 minutes with the B conference call. Unsurprisingly, this also got patched relatively fast into the life cycle of BL2, but yeah, no, it is still absolutely cracked today. Now, something as well which I considered at the tip of the iceberg, but I'm going to leave it in the sky, is hybrids. People know what hybrids are from Borderlands 1. They were a glitch in which two weapons could mesh together, but it resulted in some of the most fun and unique farming ever. And the guns that you got dropped as hybrids were also super, super cool. So yeah, hybrids, pretty cool. Two more items in the sky. We're gonna save the best for last, but instead, for now, we're gonna talk about pre-sequel bad. This is in the sky because everyone thinks it. I don't know why. I'm gonna shameless self-promo. 
go and check my video out. I've got a video talking about the pre-sequel and why I think it was so hated. In a nutshell, TLDR, it did not deserve the hate it got. Pre-sequel is a banger of a game, and if you disagree, then you can honestly kiss my asshole. But next up, we've got the porcelain pipe bomb. Every- <laughs> Everyone who has played Borderlands 3 at launch knows what the porcelain pipe bomb is. This grenade was better than half of the legendaries at launch, and probably if it was still around would be better than half of the legendaries we've got today. An absolutely broken grenade. I am not afraid to admit that I abused it. Come at me, take two. I'm here, baby. <laughs> the porcelain pipe bomb was actually broken. Like, realistically, this thing was glitched and they fixed it relatively quick, which was obviously a good thing. Although, I remember a few people dropping the game when that happened, so, uh, yeah. But that does it with the top of the iceberg. We're now moving down into TVHM. That's right, gamers. TVHM. It's got a use. And boy, is there some things to break down in here. We've got a little, some moments here from the community, and, and again, also some, some moments from other games that you might not know about. And I think we're going to start off left to right here with Slot Machines Are Rigged. That's right, gamers. This started as a, a, a theory in Borderlands 2 that Moxie's slot machines were actually rigged, and the more money you gave her, the better your chances would be to get a legendary from her slot machines. This, I don't know whether or not is true, but what we do know from Borderlands 3 is that just by Moxie slapping the machine with her ass, she can make you get Iridium. I have no idea. Maybe she's uh, an Iridian. Maybe she's uh, one of Randy Pitchford's entourage who, who knows how to do magic. I don't know. But apparently, Moxie's ass possesses magical powers which can give you Iridium. Next up is White Pearl Essence. That's right, that shiny cyan beam, that kind of tealish color you remember for Pearl Essence, actually used to be a white beam. But in case it wasn't already obvious, yes, Pearl Essence actually started out as a bug and one actually like something which was intended from the start. Next up on the iceberg, we've got Flesh Stick, the guest of honor. Again, another thing that I'm sure a lot of you you absolute filthy farmers know about from Borderlands 2. Rest in peace to homie, Flesh Stick the Guest of Honor. Absolutely got farmed to death. I, I, there was not a single one of you who played Borderlands 2 who did not abuse Flesh Stick the Guest of Honor. Can we get some Fs in the chat for the homie Flesh Stick? I want to see it, please. Next up, this one is... Oh boy. <laughs> Axton did... Axton did Prawn. A Axton did prawn. That's that's what it says on the iceberg. Axton did. Uh, I, you know what I mean. You know what I mean. Don't make me explain it. It's confirmed. It's canon. Axton is a prawn star. And and I I, I uh, butt slams. Wow. This came out of nowhere. Out of all of the mechanics which could have been done on the moon within the pre sequel, Gearbox said butt slams. That's their word. That's the name of it. Butt slams. It's no secret that the Borderlands franchise has a history of poop jokes, and I guess butt slams ties into that, since there is literally an Oz kit which makes a fart noise when you slam, and no, I'm not playing the clip, you can dislike the video if you want. Moving down the list, we've got the catapult technical is faster than Eraser in Borderlands 2. I never knew this, this came as a complete surprise, but apparently, this is true. If you choose the catapult technical in Borderlands 2, you will move faster than you will in a racer. I had no idea about this. I should probably put it lower, but it's just not that important of a fact, and I'm sure no one's going to really care about it that much anyway. The Minecraft Easter egg. Yes, they did it too. They, 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 they did a Minecraft Easter egg, and actually this is really cool. I got to say, the Minecraft Easter egg is the wackiest, but simultaneously the coolest Easter egg that I think they've ever had in Borderlands, and if you haven't checked it out, you definitely should. I thought the Minecraft Easter egg was pretty damn impressive. Moving down, we got the Mario Easter egg. Speaking of absolutely impressive Easter eggs, in the pre-sequel, there is a secret area you can go to which is taken straight out of a, a level from Mario. I mean, it, it looks exactly like a Mario level, maybe one that you'd find on the dark web. I <laughs> Another thing here at the tip of the iceberg is red rarity. This was going to be below the, 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 the tip. It was going to be in UVHM, but actually a lot of people know what red rarity is, surprisingly. In Borderlands 1, amongst the, the plethora of modded items and guns and rarities, there was the red rarity. This thing has never actually returned in Borderlands, unless you want to count health, 
But yes, there was a red rarity. I don't know much about it. I tried doing some research. I couldn't find much on it. If you know anything interesting about the red rarity, feel free to let me know in the comment section down below. But red rarity, definitely a classic. All the OGs stand up, hand on the heart. I know you remember the red rarity. Something you might also remember is the BL1 dev chest. Apparently, in one of the Rust Commons areas, there was a, a red chest in Borderlands 1, which you could open and have a higher chance of getting really good loot from. I could not for the life of me tell you exactly where this chest is, although I do think I remember where it might be. But yes, this one is quite an old one. I didn't want to put it too far under the iceberg because it's not all that important. But if you remember the BL1 death chest, be sure to let me know. Coming up next on the list is a more community moment, I guess you could say with Borderlands 3, but I put it on the list because I'm sure a lot of you are going to remember it. It's the recursion meta. The recursion meta dominated BL3 for so long that it became actually not fun. I'm glad Moxie made a lot of subs off of it, but the, rec <laughs> the recursion meta was not fun. It dominated every build. There was not a single build without a recursion in. I hate the recursion because of the recursion meta. So I, I wanted to put it on here just to address that. The recursion meta was a thing. And it was, it, it was miserable. However, slightly less miserable is Tannis on the fish. This is at the tip of the iceberg because, again, I'm sure a lot of people know about this. There is a Tannis on a fish easter egg in pretty much every single Borderlands game. I don't know why. They're honestly kind of boring. I remember being 10 years old looking at the first one in BR1. And I, I just thought, wow, this is this is boring. But hey, there's been one in every single Borderlands game since. And uh, I guess they're pretty funny. Yeah. Two more items in TVHM. And the next one is another community moment. Garwood flies with the pestilence. I'm not sure how many people are going to remember this. But long story short, YouTuber and streamer Garwood. He's a, a speedrunner within Borderlands 3. He, he took a gun called the pestilence. And he flew with it. Like genuinely took a pistol and was able to fly and boy did he ever fly he flew so far that he was able to fly straight into the air slam down and kill captain Tromp from the start of athenus to the end of athenus this was literally history making no one had ever done this in bl3 before and it was actually wild it was a huge thing and i wanted to put it on here to give it the respect it deserves so yes garwood flies with a pestilence and finally for tvhm We've got the one and only, the legendary, 94% Sham. I'm sure this one needs no explanation. A lot of people know what the 94% Sham is, but for those who don't, TLDR, it is a shield which is already extremely rare from the bunker. And when it drops, it has an absorb chance to, to go anywhere from 1% up to 94%, which is the highest percent you can get legitimately. And in a nutshell, the 94% Sham is one of the rarest items in Borderlands history. And it is notoriously a pain to farm because bunker sucks. Good luck farming a 94% sham without having bore on zero. All right, little bastards, we've made it to UVHM. This is where stuff is going to start getting really sticky. So I want you to prepare yourselves because this is where we're going to start dragging the video out to get more ad revenue. Number one, glitching queen electric chair. Oh boy, that needs rewording. <laughs> I'm sure when you hear the words glitching queen electric chair, so many things are flying through your mind. But I'm going to stop you dead in your tracks and let you know that the Glitching Queen electric chair is not what you think it is. But rather, it's a theory that was started by YouTuber Glitching Queen. I'm sure you've all heard of her. Massive inspiration to me, Glitching Queen, if you do want to get in contact. When the Fight for Lilith DLC came out for Borderlands 2, just shy of Borderlands 3's release, there was a new rarity called Effervescent. And amongst those Effervescent weapons was a rocket launcher called the World Burn. YouTuber Glitching Queen claimed that by using the world burn to wreck uranus uh, that oh god jesus you could use the world burn rocket launcher to kill uranus which was a bot within the dlc and if you killed this boss with the the world burn rocket launcher you would have an increased chance to get the electric chair effervescent grenade long story short this turned out to be completely false and as a result a lot of people bashed glitching queen for it so uh f's in the chat next up is the 100 percent iridium from tannis locker I do want to say that I was a believer of this for the longest of time and I would not like to be cyber bullied for it in the comment section, but this theory goes that within the Crimson Raiders HQ in Sanctuary in Borderlands 2, you can get a guaranteed piece of Iridium from the lockers within Tannis' little enclosure within the building. And while this is confirmed to be not true, oh my god did I believe this for so long. 
F's in the chat for your boy, Mr. NNG. Continuing on with the wacky theories, this one's gonna be a tough one to swallow for a lot of people. Krieg is Tina's father. That's right, the infamous Krieg is Tina's father. It's higher up on the iceberg because a lot of people know about this because no one stopped talking about it for years. So yes, we're talking about it. And no, Krieg is not Tina's father. Or so I don't believe. Anyway, I don't think it's ever been confirmed. I'm pretty sure they actually confirmed that it wasn't true. Krieg is not Tiny Tina's father. <laughs> Moving on, this is one that I'm sure a lot of people probably will or will not know about. This is the VIP service. It was a service launched through the Borderlands website just before Borderlands 3 launched in which you could watch ads, trailers, share posts on Twitter, and in return, you would get VIP points on the Borderlands website. You could then use these points to purchase new heads when Borderlands 3 eventually came out, guns, skins, desktop backgrounds, all of that stuff. It was actually really, really cool. I don't know why they shut it down, but they did, lo and behold, shut it down, and I think that is a huge L for them to take. Next up, we've got gearbox buffs and nerfs, specifically the ones pertaining to Borderlands 3, because, oh my god, are they wacky. And I'm sure a lot of you are watching this iceberg and thinking, wow, Epic is talking a lot about community moments and not just about myths and conspiracies within the Borderlands community. Well, let me tell you something, my friend. There is no bigger conspiracy than the way Gearbox buffs and nerfs weapons within Borderlands 3. Their method for buffing and nerfing things within Borderlands 3 is so incredibly peculiar, it is actually impossible to decipher it. They will give one of the worst guns in the game a 5% buff, but then they'll give like one of the best guns in the game a 1000% buff. Or they'll give one of the most broken items a 1% nerf, and give one of the, the, the worst items a 1000% nerf when it didn't even need nerfing. This one is definitely going to ring more bells with people who actively play Borderlands 3 and keep up to date with the hotfixes, so I do understand if you don't and you don't understand why this is on here, but for those who know about it, we'll understand why it's on the list. Gearbox buffs and nerfs is the most peculiar shit ever, and I can't believe how it's done. I don't even think we know why they do it. But moving on with the list, it's Rose's Sword from the DLC 3 Bounty of Blood within Borderlands 3. Long story short, the main antagonist of the DLC, Rose, has a really, really cool sword, which players found out you can actually mod into the game and equip and then use it against enemies. And while the sword doesn't actually have a model that you can use or see in game, you can sit there and statically swing this at enemies and again you won't see it but it will damage them which led people to believe that at one point we might see a sword melee weapon within Borderlands 3 but sadly I don't think that's the case I think this is just an asset that's left behind so they can give it to Rose so that she can use it I'm really sorry boys but I don't think we're ever getting Rose's sword inside of Borderlands 3 next up we've got Tiny Tina's Lazy Eye for those of you who don't know, popular character within the Borderlands franchise, Tiny Tina, has a glitch where occasionally when looking at her, her right eye will slide off to the right in a really weird pose and then it will go back to normal. If you don't know, this is actually a programming bug, but they found it funny and decided to leave it in the game. I put it on here because it is something which is cool. It's something that shocked the community when they first found out about it. But yeah, it's just a programming bug. She's not a cyborg. She's not a reptile. <laughs> She's, she's not a fucking reptilian, so don't worry. But yes, Tiny Tina's lazy eye is just a programming bug, but it's on here nonetheless. Next up, we've got the Guardian Takedown launch. One of the biggest conspiracy theories within the community. We've got the Guardian Takedown launch. It is one of the most wild things to ever exist. The Guardian Takedown was hyped up as a piece of content, which could potentially be the best thing we've ever seen. And then when it finally released, it was the worst thing we've ever seen. The scaling was all over the place. The alleged puzzles weren't puzzles at all, but were rather just stand in the circle games. The bosses had like 20 immunity phases. The gear drops weren't even that great. And, and it, was, it was just one massive shit sandwich and the whole community took the biggest of bites out of it. I don't want to talk much about this one because it actually angers me how bad the Guardian Takedown is. But yes, the launch of Guardian Takedown was massive within the community and actually caused a lot of people to drop Borderlands 3, understandably so. Next up on the list, we've got Jack Poison's Wilhelm. This is something that not a lot of people know about, but Wilhelm, who you sadly take the life of in Borderlands 2, was poisoned by Handsome Jack. The reason why a lot of people don't actually know about this is because it is a cut 
voice line, but Handsome Jack does state that he poisoned Wilhelm, which is why the Vault Hunters find it so easy to kill Wilhelm, understandably. And I'm guessing that Jack poisoned Wilhelm because he knew that if he didn't, Wilhelm would kill the Vault Hunters, but he actually needed for them to kill Wilhelm so that they take the power core, take it to Sanctuary, and then cause Sanctuary to get attacked. But hey, while we're on the subject of Jack, why not talk about the Jack is a good guy theory? No, not Jack is a good guy theory. Good guy theory. That's right, a lot of people, including myself, believe that Jack is actually a good guy. If you've ever played through the pre-sequel, you'll know that Handsome Jack is actually a pretty cool guy, but he was wronged by a lot of people, which sent him into a spiraling mess of, of just mental health issues, which then resulted in him going totally insane and then wanting to kill the Vault Hunters and whatnot. But Jack actually did start out as a relatively good guy, or so it's perceived within the Borderlands story. Next up on the list, we've got Lilith got Roland killed. This is something that a lot of people believe within the Borderlands community, and rightfully so, I don't think you can actually doubt what they think here. Lilith basically got Roland killed because in the Control Core Angel mission, Roland specifically tells Lilith not to come anywhere near the Control Core Angel. So after the con after the, the Vault Hunters kill Angel and, and Jack realizes that Lilith is in the chamber, he needs a replacement siren, so he has to come into the chamber to retrieve Lilith. Of course, he can't retrieve Lilith with her boyfriend in the way, so Jack, wham bam, thank you ma'am, fucks Roland up real bad. Roland dies, Lilith is now Jack's little pet like Jabba the Hutt with a chain around its neck and uh, yeah, apparently this is why Roland is dead is because Lilith would not listen. So uh, yeah, S in the chat, thank you Lilith. But Loki, if Kevin Hart was playing Roland, the bullet would have missed. Next up on the iceberg, we've got the BL3 Hammerlock DLC baits players with Githian. Oh my god, this made me so angry, and rightfully so, it is on the iceberg. This was the biggest debate ever. I think I actually would have took BL2's Hammerlock DLC over BL3's Hammerlock DLC, because at that one, at least it didn't bait us with a potential massive fight. For those of you who don't know, BL3's DLC 2 is set on Xylorgos, a planet where a dead vault monster resides, called Githian. And throughout the whole DLC, the Vault Hunter is led to believe that there is a curse in the town and, and people are being possessed by, by Githian's heart and whatnot. So we, we really thought, going into the end of the DLC, Githian would come back to the dead, we'd have this amazing, massive Vault Monster fight, and maybe even a raid boss version that we could fight afterwards. Lo and behold, it was a fucking heart. I cannot begin to tell you, this has got to be a solid F tier in terms of Vault Monster bosses or just bosses in general. Githian's heart has to be the biggest cop-out and biggest debate moment in all of Borderlands history. I don't know if, if anyone agrees with me on this, but personally, myself and people that I've asked about this do agree. This was one of the biggest debate moments ever. Let me know what you think of it in the comments. The bait for Githian was so wrong, and I will never forgive you, Gearbox. Speaking about never forgiving people, Lilith stalks Roland. Oh boy, what a messy situation here. So it's no secret within the Borderlands franchise that Lilith and Roland did indeed at one point date. I can't blame Lilith, I mean Roland is a massive hunk of a man, just oh what a baddie. So Lilith wants to date Roland, they date, they're dating in the pre-sequel, they're, they're on they're on Elpis as kind of their, their little honeymoon. But something between pre-sequel and Borderlands 2 must have happened, because when you go to the Firehawks lair, you can actually see on some of the screens in the lair itself that Lilith has been stalking Roland's social media pages. Oh boy, you, you naughty person. Can we lock away Lilith at this point? She got him killed, she was stalking him. Lilith is actually a criminal at this point. So yeah, I thought that I'd put this one on the list because not a lot of people know about it, but some do, which is why it's kind of midway there. But yeah, Lilith stalked Roland at one point. Very sad. S in the chat. Next up, we've got the Lancer vehicle. This is a vehicle within the General Knox's Armory DLC from Borderlands 1. Uh, a lot of people surprisingly don't know that this existed, but yes, there is a mission. I know it's bizarre that this vehicle only exists within a mission, but yes, in the, in the Knox DLC, there is a side mission which you can pick up, which will allow you to go and collect parts for a special vehicle. And when you turn it in, you can actually gain control of the Lancer vehicle, which is the vehicle that the Crimson Lancemen drive within the Nox DLC. Very bizarre, very shocking that it's only accessible through a side mission. I would have thought if you're going to go through all the effort of making a new vehicle for someone to drive, that you might as well just put it in there from the start. 
But hey, I thought I'd put this on here because not a lot of people know about this. But yes, the Lancer vehicle is indeed a, a thing you can go and get. Now, as we come to the end of UVHM here, we've got a very popular one and a very controversial one. It's the Endless Weight for Borderlands 3. Now, while this one is very understandable because of how many times Gearbox had to switch development plans and engines throughout development for Borderlands 3, the Endless Weight for BL3 was insane. The tension was so high every time a PAX rolled around or E3 or Game Awards or any any like announcement related game show rolled around, you could cut the tension with a knife. Everyone was waiting for Borderlands 3 and to nobody's surprise, when it was finally announced, it blew up. It trended on Twitter. The trailer got over 5 million views in just a few days or, or like a week. It was huge. But the endless wait for BL3 was one of the biggest moments within the Borderlands community. Everyone wanted it. It was one of them things where it felt like it was never going to end. And speaking of never going to end, Grandma Flexington. We're at the part of the list now where we are talking about just the craziest shit that they've done with the Borderlands franchise. Grandma Flexington from the Headhunter, the Wattle Gobbler, Gobbler Headhunter. One of the most bizarre, annoying, boring pointless side missions ever made but for those of you who don't know about it there was a side mission in a borderlands headhunter that you actually had to pay money for where you dead ass had to listen to a grandma's story that was it and she'd ask you questions throughout the story to make sure you were still listening and if you got it wrong she would restart the story all over again it's something that you'd see in like a ps1 game so i have no idea why they put it in bl2 Admittedly, I thought it was kind of funny, but it pissed a lot of people off. And finishing off in UVHM with one of the more bizarre things we've ever seen in the Borderlands franchise, the Lord of the Rings Easter egg from Borderlands 2. This was a very bizarre one, but nonetheless, you had to go to Claptrap's place once you had got to Iridium Blight or beaten Borderlands 2. I can't remember specifically what one you had to do, but in a nutshell, to do this Easter egg, you would go back to Claptrap's place, and in the fireplace would be a ring, which you'd have to pick up, and then you would have to navigate your way to a volcano within the Iridium Blight without using cars or fast travel. You would have to go there completely on foot. Actually, I think you could use a car. I'm not entirely sure, but you was not allowed to use the fast travel station. You had to make your way hard style all the way up to the volcano in Iridium Blight, at which case you'd be attacked by enemies which would correlate to the Lord of the Rings universe. Very bizarre. It's not on the list because it was bad or anything. Just one of the most bizarre things ever and something which probably took a lot of work to put into the game. But hey, this is Borderlands after all. All right, congratulations gamers. We've made it to OP8. I know you love OP8, so we're here. And we're going to start off with the most bizarre theory ever. It's a theory which I could not find anything on. I just remember it being a thing at the time. You've heard about Krieg is Tina's father. But now, I want you to ready yourself. Roland is Tina's father. I, I don't know what to say about this one. I don't really remember it all too much. All that I know is that this at one point was a theory. I think it had to do with the fact that there was a picture of Tina riding on Roland's shoulder. I don't know why that would make people think that Tina is Roland's daughter. But yes, it was something at some point. I've got it higher up in the OP8 section because I don't know much about it. But just know that this was a thing and we can all forget it as soon as we go to bed tonight. Next up is Axton's accidental bisexuality. This is something which was a shock to me and I actually never knew about. But sure enough, yes, it was a bug that Axton was heavily implied to be bisexual. And in the end... Gearbox just kind of ran with it, which I think is pretty damn cool. It's kind of hard to show you guys what I'm talking about with this point, but in a nutshell, there were voice lines from Axton within Borderlands 2 where he would compliment Vault Hunters, male or female, when he was reviving them in remarks which made it seem like he was attracted to them. And apparently, these voice lines were actually meant for Maya at the time. But Gearbox said, you know what? Why not? Having a bisexual Vault Hunter is cool, so they left it in. And I agree. I think it is pretty cool. And overall, I think it added more depth to Axton's very, very bland personality. Moving on, we've got Reese is working for Jack. This is an ongoing theory in Borderlands 3. For those of you who didn't play Tales from the Borderlands, Handsome Jack had an AI which somehow managed to manifest its way into Reese's brain. And throughout the rest of the Tales from the Borderlands, from that moment onwards, Jack is trying to take control of Reese and bring himself back to life. And at the end, we are left on a cliffhanger with Reese destroying or keeping the AI chip 
which houses Handsome Jack. And then magically within Borderlands 3, it's revealed that Reese is the Atlas CEO and he's got all these connections and, and all of a sudden he's very matured and people are wondering if maybe the reason for this is because he's working for Jack and Jack is pulling the strings and Reese is just the puppet. Also, as we're going to touch on later on in the iceberg, Handsome Jack was going to come back in BO3 at some point. So it is one of them theories where people, including myself, believe that Reese at one point was going to bring Handsome Jack back and start working for him. And the two would be their little dynamic duo partners in crime within Borderlands 3. But this is not proven and we won't know for sure until the next game. Next up, Penn and Teller. I don't want to talk too much about this one. Celebrity cameos in video games are one of the dumbest things ever. I'm not a big fan of them. And when Gearbox announced that Penn and Teller would be... A feature in Borderlands 3, I think a lot of people were shocked. Uh, not too shocked because Randy Pitchford is friends with Penn Gillette, but I think we were all very, very surprised when Borderlands 3 released and Penn and Teller got a whole chapter within the main story of Borderlands 3. Like straight up, the boss is called Pain and Terror and the character models is just Penn and Teller. I do not know why this ever made it into the game. I don't know why it was ever pitched. It makes no sense whatsoever. It, it transcends the point of, wow, Borderlands is so wacky and just starts being, hey, look at this celebrity cameo. I don't understand it. And apparently, Pendulette is also getting a cameo in the Borderlands movie. I don't hate Pendulette. I really like Pendulette, but I don't want Pendulette in my Borderlands games nonstop. Please stop it, Gearbox. Please. Moving on, we've got the Crossroad 4th Pellet. Those of you who play Borderlands 3 at launch will definitely remember this one and probably be a little angry at this one as it coincides with the change to the hex grenade. But at one point, there was a hotfix which was done to Borderlands 3 where they felt like the Crossroad Legendary SMG was overperforming slightly. So instead of just lowering its damage like you would with a normal hotfix to a gun which is overperforming, Gearbox removed the fourth pellet from the Crossroads SMG, which subsequently made it worse for pretty much every single build and just made no sense. Like, if you want to lower the damage, you can do it without removing the fourth pellet. We never got a reason as to why they had to remove the fourth pellet if it was something unrelated. All we know is that it was done for damage purposes, which makes no sense because they literally just could have lowered the damage on it. Moving on next, we've got the Lyuda slash White Death. For whatever reason, in Borderlands 2, there is a legendary sniper rifle most commonly referred to as the Lyuda. But funnily enough, if you play on Xbox 360, the Lyuda is actually called the White Death. No one really knows why, although I do think that the White Death is a better name for the, the Lyuda. But yes, this was so peculiar and for a while in the community, everyone was stumped on why their names were different. And I think to this day, it is still called the White Death if you play on Xbox 360. But the Lyuda White Death is more of an iconic conspiracy theory slash myth slash rumor in the community, which I wanted to include on the list. Next up, we've got the Diamond Weisenheimer. One of the rarest items in Borderlands history is the Diamond Weisenheimer SMG. Long story short, the Diamond Weisenheimer is a gemstone weapon from the Tina DLC. And for whatever reason, the Diamond Weisenheimer stands today as one of the rarest items in Borderlands history. And it's not even a legendary. It is a purple SMG. Moving on, we have Jack uses the Destroyer's Eye. Yes, that's right. The Vault Monster, which gives you $10 at the end of Borderlands 1. After the Vault Hunters take it out, it is revealed through the Claptastic Voyage DLC and the story of the pre-sequel that after killing the Destroyer at the end of BL1, Hyperion moved in, retrieved the eye from the Destroyer and then gave it to Handsome Jack who was able to implant it into the eye of Helios, which is the massive laser which you see firing at the moon in the pre-sequel. That is actually the Destroyer's eye. But I will say, I don't think this one makes complete sense because after you kill the Destroyer within Borderlands 1, it goes straight back into the vault. So it doesn't really make sense how Hyperion could have got there to get the eye. It was kind of something which was more shoehorned in for the sake of being cool. But I mean, it is cool. And I'm willing to overlook the, the little loophole they've got in there. So yeah. 
Jack used the Destroyer's Eye for the Eye of Helios. I'm sure a lot of people know about this. This is only going deeper into the iceberg. It's going to get a lot wackier than this, so strap in. The next ones we're going to be talking about are more so confirmed, and the first one is that Tannis is completely insane. This is revealed through numerous echo logs in Borderlands 2, and just from hinted little intro cards within Borderlands 2 and 3 as well, that Tannis is completely insane from all of the things she's seen on Pandora. This one's very sad. I'm not going to spend too much time on it because it's not that important, and it's really not that interesting either. But long story short, Tannis is insane, and yeah, you maybe shouldn't trust her. Moving on next, another one that we're not going to talk too much about because it's not that interesting is crazy Earl is a cannibal this is hinted at numerous times throughout the Borderlands franchise and Scooter even details the time that crazy Earl ate a car with a knife and fork which I don't think ties into being a cannibal at all but if he's eating cars he's probably eating people too so just be careful of that one crazy Earl very weird guy so if he's a cannibal it would not surprise me Moving on, we've got the Checkerbox Cube. This is something which has appeared in pretty much every single Borderlands game, barring Tales, of course. The Checkerbox Cube is something you can find underneath every single Borderlands level. It is believed that the Checkerbox Cube is where they house the little intro of your character coming in with the, the portal animation. You get teleported to the Checkerbox Cube there when you respawn, when you travel in. So I think that's what the cube is for. I could be wrong on that, so do let me know if that's true or false. But the Checkerbox Cube is underneath every level, and if you've never gotten out of the map to try and land on it, then oh my god, what are you doing? Next up, we've got Bloodwing's Gender. This is brought up on the list because at numerous times throughout the Borderlands franchise, it is heavily implied that Bloodwing is either a guy or a girl, and it actually seems that in the end, the answer to this mystery was that Bloodwing's Gender is actually a rare species which actually shifts throughout its life cycle. I'm pretty sure they did this just to cover up to the fact that, that, that they kept messing up which gender Bloodwing was. But apparently, when Bloodwing goes through its life cycle, it will change gender. And I'm pretty sure the one that dies in Borderlands 2 is a girl, and the one in Borderlands 1 is a guy. It's really uncertain, but I think the only explanation we have is that yes, Bloodwing's gender does manifest and change as it goes through its life cycle. So I just thought I'd put this one on the list because it's a confusing one for sure, but definitely an interesting one. Next up, we've got Evil Claptraps. This one isn't that interesting, but it is something that not too many people know about. But in a nutshell, throughout the Borderlands franchise, Claptraps have turned evil numerous times, like seriously, numerous times. And, uh, and yeah, this is, this is just one of them ongoing jokes that the Claptraps keep turning evil, and then you go after them, you turn them not evil, then they go evil again. We got Fragtrap in pre-sequel who was working with the evil guys. It's just an ongoing meme at this point that Claptrap constantly wants to rebel, and then we have EOS in pre- it, there, there is a lot of there is a lot of evil clap traps next up we've got borderlands online i'm sure a lot of people know what borderlands online is but it's this deep down in the iceberg just because we didn't really know all too much about borderlands online because it sadly never came out for those of you who don't know borderlands line was going to be a chinese exclusive game which was licensed by 2k and you could choose your own vault hunter you can make them look unique and uh, yeah, this never came to be. 2K didn't really want to buckle down with it. So it was cancelled halfway through. And uh, we didn't really get much out of it other than some leaked gameplay. But Borderlands Online would have been really, really cool. Although I can't say I blame 2K for dropping it. Moving on, we've got Dr. Ned, Dr. Zed, Dr. Ted, Dr. Bed, Dr. Dead. Whatever he's been throughout the series, Dr. Zed has got more offsprings. It, 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 like, I, you, you, there's nothing else which has more offsprings than Dr. Zed. Please, someone explain to me how many relatives Dr. Zed has and where they're coming from. Moving on, we've got Lilith in a bikini. This was a car skin that you could get in Borderlands 2. It was Lilith in a bikini, but it was very weird. I don't think anyone could have predicted it. But yes, there is a skin in Borderlands 2 for your vehicle that places Lilith inside of a bikini. And uh, and yeah, this one just came out of nowhere. That's why it's on the list. Now, ending off OP8, I know it's been a while, but we're finally ending off and we're going to OP10 next. The last thing on OP8 is that Roland isn't dead. Yes, that's right, gamers. Players believe, or some players believe, maybe like a small fraction, like a little, a little group of, of scientists believe that Roland isn't actually dead, and the bullet that Jack fired into Roland from <laughs> from the Control Core Angel mission somehow didn't kill him. 
even though we totally see him die in a cutscene, and as you're going to find out later on in the list, that is very, very important. But yes, people believe that Roland isn't dead, however, that has been proved to be not true. Guys, Roland is actually dead, it's canonical at this point, he is gone. Okay, congratulations, we've made it to OP10 and we only have two more hours of the list to go. So we're going to start off and quick fire a few of these because we do need to get going because oh boy the whole oh, this is going long already. So the first one is stealth nerfing. This is something which is not a secret. It has been done before. This is proven to be true. Gearbox numerous times through the past have stealth nerfed a bunch of stuff in Borderlands without telling players. It has definitely pissed a lot of people off. I don't really care about it too much, but yes, Gearbox has stealth nerfed a bunch of things, and they've also stealth fixed a bunch of things as well, so let's not paint them out to be bad guys here. But yes, stealth nerfing is something that has been around for a while, and if you don't know about it, well, now you're at the bottom of the iceberg. You, you know about it now. Moving on is Slag. This one is at the bottom of the iceberg because while a lot of people do know about Slag, what you might not know is that Slag was actually going to return in Borderlands 3 at one point, but I think Gearbox at some, some point in development twigged on to the fact that people do not like Slag, so they ended up taking it out entirely, and I think that was definitely a good choice because even though I personally liked Slag, a lot of people didn't. And uh, yeah, luckily it did not return in Borderlands 3. Next up, we've got the perfect Hide of Terror. The Hide of Terror Morphous is a drop from Terror Morphous the Invincible in Borderlands 2. But to get a perfect Hide of Terror, you are looking at what is undoubtedly the rarest item in the, in the whole of Borderlands history. I really don't think there is anything more rare than the Hide of Terror. I'm sure someone will correct me if I'm wrong. I don't even think the Nemesis Invader is more rare than the Hide of Terror. This thing, from what I know, is so incredibly rare that you could play the game for seven years and you probably still would not get a perfect Hide of Terror. That's how rare they are. Continuing on down the iceberg, we've got Maurice. I'm sure a lot of people who play Borderlands 3 know who Maurice is, but Maurice is on the iceberg because we don't really know all too much about Maurice. Other than that, he's a Saurian. How is there a talking Saurian on Sanctuary? I don't know. This is where we're getting into the realm of Borderlands fuckery, where no one really knows truly what's going on anymore. They're just adding bizarre stuff. And first on here is Maurice. It is a talking dinosaur. It's got its own room on Sanctuary. I don't understand. A quick one we're going to debunk here is the ghost of Face McShooty. This is a conspiracy theory brought up on Reddit because of course that's where it was brought up and this one implies that there is a ghost of Face McShooty in Thousand Cuts because after the player killed Face McShooty and went to the edge of the cliff he died on impact. Every single time it was repeatable if he went to the place where Face McShooty died he would insta die. But after testing this out on stream I can confirm that this is not the case it's just a poorly placed death barrier which kills the player and it's there regardless of whether or not you kill Face McShooty. The next one is that the new you isn't canon or is canon no one really knows i was unable to find any quote from gearbox which says that the new you is or isn't canon although something later down the list might confirm or not confirm this this one is so messy i'm not even going to spend long on it i do not know if there is actually a factual answer for this no one really knows if the new you is or isn't canon if you do please so show me some kind of proof i could not find it i scoured for hours I could not find any proof that the new you is or is not canon. This one is very bizarre, as well as what else is bizarre is that apparently Aurelia is a siren. That's something else we need to talk about. People think Aurelia is a siren. I don't know if she is or isn't. Apparently, what she actually is, is a very rich person, and the ice shards that she's able to throw on command is just a super rare gadget that she has because she's so rich, and Aurelia is not actually a siren. I'm pretty sure that one has been debunked, but I thought I'd put it on here because that's another confusing thing that people keep bringing up. But no, I don't think Aurelia is a siren. It's just a really extremely rare gadget that she owns because she's rich. But who cares? She's dead now. I can have the gadget. I'm going to sell it on eBay. Fuck it. I might start selling my gamer guy piss. Next up on the list, we've got Border Worlds. In the lead up to Borderlands 3, a lot of people, for whatever reason, believed that the new game was going to be called Border Worlds. 
I don't know where this theory came from. Maybe because people got the leaks out that we were going to be going to other planets, so they thought the game was going to be called Border Worlds. I was sick and tired of hearing Border Worlds. You could go to a quinceanera, you'd hear Border Worlds. You could go to a carnival, you'd hear Border Worlds. You could go to your grandpa's funeral and he'd probably whisper out the coffin, Border Worlds. This shit was fucking annoying, and I'm so glad that we got away with it when Borderlands 3 was announced. Border Worlds, Border Worlds, Border Worlds, it never happened. But something which could actually happen is the Seventh Siren. This is heavily implied through the lore logs at the end of Borderlands 3, or throughout Borderlands 3 I guess you could say as well, that there is a Seventh Siren in the Siren universe that the Vault Hunters must never find. I don't know too much about this one. I'm not Eruption Fang. I'm not going to sit here and fill your mind with lore. That's not even true. But apparently there is a seventh siren who the Vault Hunters may never find. And low key, I might, it might be Claptrap. If it's Claptrap, would, would anyone here object? Moving on now as we get to more of the bottom of the iceberg. We've got Mayhem 2.0. If you are a Borderlands 3 player, you know why Mayhem 2.0 is at the bottom of the iceberg. But for those who don't, the reason why Mayhem 2.0 is at the bottom of this iceberg is because it's a fucking mystery why they messed up Mayhem so bad. And it's also an even bigger mystery why they never took us back to Mayhem 2 meta afterwards. Because Mayhem 2.0 lost a lot of players for Borderlands 3 and could have subsequently been the end of the game if they didn't keep updating it. Mayhem 2.0 was an absolute disaster. For some reason they thought they had to overhaul Mayhem, which just was not the case because Mayhem was pretty damn good in its current state. But, yes, they made an executive decision to overhaul Mayhem, and instead all they did was break it even harder. Moving on with the list, this one is a very, very sticky situation, and I have got a video on my channel if you want to check this one out. It is the theory that Timothy Lawrence is Handsome Jack. There is so much to talk about with this one specifically, it would probably draw the video out even longer. So I'm going to try to keep this one short and sweet. But in a nutshell, there are numerous things throughout the story of the Handsome Jackpot DLC and throughout the lore history of Timothy Lawrence and Handsome Jack that Timothy Lawrence could actually be Handsome Jack and that the Handsome Jack we kill at the end of Borderlands 2 isn't actually Handsome Jack and is actually Timothy Lawrence and that's why Jack is actually Timothy Lawrence in, in, in the, the Moxie's Heist DLC. This one is so confusing it deserves its own documentary but there is numerous things pointing at Timothy being Jack or Jack being Timothy. The whole body double situation is an absolute mess, but take my word for it, there is actual proof which points to the fact that Timothy Lawrence might actually be dead and Handsome Jack might be alive or vice versa. This could point to a return of Handsome Jack in Borderlands 4 and for those saying that it wouldn't make sense, slow down, do your research because this one actually makes perfect sense. Yes, that's right. Timothy Lawrence could actually be Handsome Jack. He could be morphing into Handsome Jack. Handsome Jack is not dead. That's what you need to take away from this. But something I want to take away is who is Zero? Who is Zero? Do we know who Zero is? Apparently, Tannis is the only person who knows who Zero is. Who is Zero? Is it an Iridian? Is it Vinylic Puma? Is it Glitching Queen? I don't know, but no one else does apparently. Who is Zero? Can we know? I don't think we'll ever know. Zero. We, we, who is it? Who is it? Next up on the list, we've got Shift Coins. Shift Coins were a thing in Borderlands the pre-sequel, which could be accessed via cheat tables. And when you got them in-game, they appeared as Shift Coins. No one really knows what they did. Uh, apparently, they were going to have some kind of interaction with the Shift mas Machine in Concordia. But long story short, no one really knows what Shift Coins were. But they were in pre-sequel at one point. As we proceed on to the end of OP10, we've got Captain Scarlet is alive. I don't think this one is more of a theory, but it's more of a rumor as to where she could be. But yes, we don't ever see Captain Scarlet actually die, which leads many people to believe that she is indeed alive. And we're waiting to see her make her return at some point in the series. I don't know if anyone can find any more information on this. Maybe I'm just going peanut brain here and I don't know 
whether or not she's dead or alive, but from what I could see from doing as much research as possible, Captain Scarlet never died and she is open to make a return at some point in the future. Moving on, we've got the pre-sequel Scams It's Fans. That's right, for those of you unfamiliar with Borderlands the pre-sequels DLC cycle, it had a season pass which had a slated four DLCs to come out, but after 2K Australia sadly had to shut down, fans never got their four DLCs and only got the Claptastic Voice. Voyage DLC instead. But if you ask people for their opinion on this, you might get mixed signals back. Some will say they did, some will say they didn't. Apparently, if you take a look at the graph for the pre sequel season pass, they actually kept to their word and players did get what they were promised, but some people say differently. This one is near the bottom of the iceberg just because of how many people go back and forth on it, whether or not the pre sequel scammed their fans on a season pass. Make your own conclusions from it. I'm leaning towards they didn't. Some people are vowing that they did so yes that's why it's on here next up with more wacky shit in borderlands history excalibastard from borderlands the pre-sequel this was a gun similar to the excalibur hence the name where you would have to go over to this gun it was a legendary laser shotgun and if you had enough badass rank you could reach into the stone and pull out the legendary excalibastard this one is just so wild i had to put it on here i thought it was super cool though so yeah the excalibastard and to continue on with more wild shit, we fought a fucking train in Borderlands. That's right, the, the Psycho Kriegs Fantastic Fuster Cluck from Borderlands 3. There is a boss called Locomobius, which is a train. A train. Now, I know it's in this crazy Krieg DLC, but I just want <laughs> to bring up how wild it is, the concept that we actually fought a train in Borderlands. Uh, there's not much more to say about this, just really crazy shit. And finally, ending off OP10, we have the popular theory, how could we not talk about it? Ava got Maya killed. This is something that people strongly believe, and you could go back and forth in it all day. I'm just going to give my two cents on it right now. Break the fourth wall here, kiddos. This is a video game written by Gearbox. If Ava didn't get Maya killed, someone else would have. And it's already been confirmed that Maya would have died regardless of Ava's involvement there. So I don't think Ava got Maya killed. But I did want to put it on there because it is a big shit salad that people like to take bites into from here and there. And yeah, I wanted to put it on here. So apparently Ava got Maya killed. It's canonically not true. But yeah, it's on here. But with that being said, that does it with OP10. It's time to move on to OP21. That's right, boys. You paid for this DLC. Starting off in OP21, we've got the Flame Rock Refuge Hidden Vault. That's right. Outside of Flame Rock Refuge, there is a vault, which we never get to see, or at least it doesn't seem that we do. And since Tina's DLC is basically made up, it's unclear if this vault is canonical or what it might be. But all we know is that there is a hidden vault outside of Flame Rock Refuge, which is pretty damn cool. Moving on, we've got the error message. This is the rocket launcher that Master G the Invincible wields. And in some cases, players were able to use mods to get this thing to drop for them. There's nothing really special about this. It's basically just an Ahab, but it's still pretty interesting nonetheless. And I'm sure a lot of people remember the time that the error message thing was going around on YouTube. And yeah, pretty cool, pretty cool memory. Next is Borderlands Mobile. Oh boy, this one is a funny one to talk about. For those of you who don't already know, a long, long time ago, there was a game for iOS titled Borderlands Mobile, which was essentially just a top-down shoot for Borderlands, but boy, oh boy, was it a flop. I don't really know too much about Borderlands Mobile, and you can't even get it today, which makes this even more hard to talk about, but I do know that there were situations where sometimes you'd have to pay to unlock the next levels, which is absolutely ridiculous, and also, apparently, the game was just completely boring, so that never helps the situation either. Next, we've got the Ascension Bluff Door. How could we have a borderlands iceberg without talking about the ascension bluff door in typical borderlands fashion there is usually some kind of hidden invincible at the end of the game or within a dlc and in borderlands 3 we do have that in dlc 6 now however when the game released it was very 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 apparent from gameplay leaks we had seen stuff in the files and also the ascension bluff door that there was supposed to be an invincible at launch for borderlands 3 but there just never was we'll talk about this more later but long story short short the ascension bluff door was one of the biggest mysteries in the bl3 community for so long and oh boy oh boy following after that we've got timothy lawrence died in opportunity i don't know why i constantly have to bring this one up but we do because people still think that timothy lawrence actually died in opportunity and that's why there's no doppelganger guys 
it was an engineer. Once you kill the body double, it turns into an engineer. So yes, Jack's body double is not Timothy Lawrence. That was a very, very massive conspiracy theory and myth in the community for so long. I, I don't know why. You literally see it turn into an engineer. Next, we've got Rainbow Rarity. This was added in the Commander Lilith DLC for Borderlands 2, but we actually knew about Rainbow Rarity beforehand due to some leaks within the game. And this one is at OP21, just because the, the whole idea of a Rainbow Rarity in Borderlands is absolutely insane. And while we're at it, we should also bring up Black Rarity as well. Black Rarity weapons was a thing in the game at some point, and even though I feel like it should probably be higher up on the iceberg, I'm really not too bothered since Black Rarity weapons were such a weird thing in Borderlands 2 at the time. So yeah, Rainbow Rarity and Black Rarity, you've kind of got like a little double entry there. Moving on, we've got the Bane. What a bizarre, bizarre mission. But the Bane brought in a lot of mainstream attention to Borderlands, and rightfully so. It was absolutely bonkers. For those of you who don't know what the Bane is, it was a side mission where you'd have to investigate a curse of a gun called the Bane, and when you finally track down the Bane, it is revealed what that curse is. And it's that every time you hold the weapon, you become extremely slow, the gun is really bad, and it screams at you. Like, just constantly, constantly screams at you. Totally bizarre absolutely wild next we've got tdr guns exploding in your hand i don't think this is one that a lot of people are going to remember but yes in the leaked borderlands 2 gameplay back in like 2011 randy pitchford i i believe it was randy pitchford said that tdr guns when they were being introduced had a chance to explode in your hand when you reloaded them and boy oh boy i'm so glad that never made it into the game following that we've got vault hunters are evil this one i can't talk too much about because there's not much that i know about it but i think for those who know they'll know uh there's this ongoing theory in borderlands and i guess you could say conspiracy theory from little hints with echoes here and there and from the iridians like scourge and whatnot that the vault hunters are actually evil and you know that classic saying everyone's the the hero of their own story kind of applies to the vault hunters so yeah apparently the vault hunters are doing more bad than they are good if anyone wants to discuss this in the comments i'd love to know more about it something i'd also love to know more about is the seraphender being an iridian this was a theory that was on reddit a, a long time ago but yes apparently the seraph vendor in borderlands 2 is some kind of iridian because of the color of his eyes and also how he just shows up out of nowhere and is able to provide you with these really unique guns that you've never seen before for a currency that you're getting from these ultra powerful beings and and yeah where did the dude come from it, it kind of makes sense i don't know for sure couldn't find too much on this apart from a few posts here and there asking hey do you think this guy's an iridian oh he might be an iridian so yes if you know more about this as well please feel free to let me know as we get to the bottom of the iceberg you're going to be hearing me say that a lot now please let me know if you know anything about what comes after this one including axton fucking his turret i don't know where this one came from i think this has actually been confirmed though although i i really really cannot provide you with an audio clip i actually think it's an arms race where this is confirmed i'm not entirely sure but there seems to be like this ongoing joke in the community that axton the commando fucked his turret i don't know that for sure if he did fuck his turret then uh, good for him i mean hey man uh, oh, power to you buddy it reminds me of that dude from that little uh, tlc documentary who fucked the exhaust pipe on his car power to you axton and ending off in op 21 see i told you we'd go quicker we've got handsome jack was going to return in borderlands 3 yes gamers this is canon this is confirmed and it's even more confirmed by this little screenshot here which i got from the behind the scenes content in dlc 6 which shows that in early bl3 development handsome jack was actually going to be in charge of promethea and now if we dial back the clock a bit take some fucking zannies now i want you to think about what we talked about earlier in regards to reese working for jack that's why i said that reese might be working for jack because in the early concept art jack was in charge of promethea but in the final product it's actually reese in charge of promethea so it makes you wonder how was jack going to be in charge of promethea this one is absolutely wild i would have loved to see jack return but not everyone thinks the same all right you mega pussies we've made it to op 75 this is where things are getting really really messy and i'm sorry if there's a lack of information on these ones 
They are just so out there, it is very hard. Number one, Lilith is Commandant Steel. This one is confirmed, or, or rather, not she's Commandant Steel, but Lilith was going to look like Commandant Steel, I should say. In the early concept art for Borderlands 1, it's actually revealed that Lilith's OG design is actually Commandant Steel from the end of the game. There's also some other wild stuff in there that we'll get into in a minute. One of them is that Roland was going to be a white dude at one point and actually looks fairly similar to Accident, which is kind of weird. But the second one, and this leads us into our next point, is that Mordecai is Reaver and Reaver is Mordecai. For those of you who don't know, Reaver is a boss in Borderlands 1 encountered in Chrome's Canyon who drops the Reaver's Edge, but what's actually unique about Reaver is that his character model is actually the first original character model for Mordecai, which is really bizarre, and I just thought that'd be really important to put in here because I'm not sure a lot of people know about that, and it definitely shocked me when I found out. Next up, we've got Epic Exclusivity, and I know, I know, dry your tears, kiddos, dry your tears, it's gonna be okay. Epic Exclusivity. When you mention those words, the first thing you think about is how this single-handedly almost killed BL3 and stopped its hype dead in its tracks. Epic's six-month exclusivity deal with Gearbox and 2K might just be the worst decision ever made in Borderlands history. Let me know if you agree with that in the comment section down below. I don't want to spend too much time on this one because I don't have much positive things to say about it. But yes, Epic exclusivity was very, very very bad for Borderlands 3 and might again just be one of the worst decisions they've ever made. But following this we've got the theory that Lilith isn't dead and we actually have some partial confirmation here. Now because there's too many Borderlands shows to sift through to find where this happened you're just gonna have to take my word on it but I believe it was Graham Timmins or maybe Randy Varnell in an episode of the Borderlands show who said that Lilith is gone when when they were asked if she's dead or not so lilith isn't actually dead or so it seems and again we talked about or rather we're going to be talking about later on about dying in cutscenes and whatnot it definitely seems that lilith is not dead and i guess we have partial confirmation on this but this is definitely one of those wild theories which is why it's right below the iceberg another thing right below the iceberg is loaderbot everywhere I don't know where this one came from, but there was a theory leading up to Borderlands 3 that Flak was actually Loaderbot, and then there was also a theory that that Loaderbot was going to be a boss in Borderlands 3, and, and who knows, maybe Loaderbot's going to be an AI in Borderlands... Loaderbot being everywhere is a top quality meme, and you know what, I just got to give it to the people who come up with this stuff. Loaderbot is everywhere. I, I I believe it now. Loaderbot's eternal. Speaking of being eternal, Lilith eats the moon. Wow, this was fucking bizarre. Flying towards Elpis, the thing that's currently trying to open Pandora. I wonder what we can do to stop it. Should we destroy the moon like Zarpadon was trying to do? No, let's swallow it instead. I don't get this one. Definitely very wild. I don't have anything against it, although it is really funny in DLC 4 when Lilith, you go and interact with her and she talks about how she ate the moon and whatnot. I think that this is just more of a funny thing more than anything, but it was just kind of weird and, and yeah, a li little bit peculiar that she swallowed the moon and engulfed it in a firehawk symbol like, okay, bro, self-promo, but you know, you do you. Speaking of doing yourself, Marcus stories. These are fucking everyone. I don't know what the deal is with Marcus Stories. It seemed like in Borderlands 1 and partially Borderlands 2 that they were kind of going with this, this whole narrative that the Borderlands stories aren't actually real, but rather just stories that Marcus tells to his grandchild or stories that are being told to Marcus. I don't know if we ever got confirmation of this. Very, very weird and very hard to sum up and explain properly without diving down six different wormholes here. But yeah, I think Marcus stories are canon slash non-canon. It's, it's really bizarre. No one really knows. But what we do know about is the cancelled Scarlet DLC within Borderlands 3. This one is absolutely weird and is confirmed as being true. So I'm going to leave a link to my friend Hater Hype's video in the description if you want to check out the 
full DLC details and whatnot. There's car audio. There's there's information on what the DLC was going to be called. And I can tell you right now that yes, assets from this DLC were found within the files of Borderlands 3. There was genuinely going to be some kind of second Scarlet DLC. But what do I mean by Scarlet DLC? Do I mean that Scarlet was going to return? No, I don't think Scarlet was going to return. But there are hints in the DLC of there being a pirate ship map, being a pirate bartender, amongst a bunch of other things. And again, there's a link to Hater Hype's video in the description should you want to go and find out more. Very, very, very interesting stuff. What's also very interesting is the Mimic Easter Egg. The Mimic Easter Egg in Tina's DLC absolutely wild i still don't know how to properly trigger it to this day i followed maybe like 20 tutorials and was never able to get this to work but in a nutshell when you go through the tina's dlc and you get to the dragons of destruction raid boss you can trigger this easter egg where you can see a massive stone golem fighting a massive mimic off in the distance absolutely bizarre but still one of the coolest easter eggs we've ever seen implemented i think this one is absolutely bizarre it's mount jackmore Mount Jackmore was used as marketing for Borderlands 2 leading up to the launch where players would go to a website and they'd be faced with a massive statue of Handsome Jack's face in which they'd point and click at it endlessly, chipping away at the statue to deface it. And when they did this, they'd have chances to win actual rewards like Borderlands pins and other swagger like that. I don't know too much about Mount Jackmore. It is, it's one of those things which when it went away, a lot of the details around it did as well. And when it was released, not many people twigged on to what it was or really cared about it too much as well. I'm sure a lot of other people who were following Borderlands 2 a lot closer to its release are going to know more about Mount Jackmore. But yeah, I'll, I've got a video on screen right now. You can kind of see what the deal with Mount Jackmore is. I never got to play it, which is very, very, very sad. I really wish that I could have. But yes, yeah, sadly, Mount Jackmore is not playable anymore. But boy, what a wild idea. This next one isn't all that crazy, although I do want to bring it up because it's definitely one of the more interesting things we've ever seen from Borderlands. And I'm not sure a lot of people realize that it was a thing. It kind of went under the radar for a few people. But there was a Borderlands Fortnite collab where they actually had a Borderlands area on their map as well as a Borderlands Psycho character with a, a Claptrap little backpack. And just, how? How did this become a thing? I don't know. Very very weird. Maybe because of the, the Epic exclusivity that maybe opened doors for this to happen. Big Dubsky for Borderlands. Very weird, but Big Dubsky, congratulations. The, the, the Borderlands Fortnite collab was very, very bizarre. But nonetheless, it was pretty interesting. I can't fold it. What's even more interesting, though, is Luxie's Space Adventure. Now, this one is at the bottom of the iceberg only because of how wild it is and how crazy this DLC sounded. This isn't down here more so because people don't know about it. And that's why I'm not going to talk too much about Luxie's either because I'm sure a lot of people know what it is by now. But in a nutshell, it's basically the Commander Lilith DLC but for Borderlands the pre-sequel. However, sadly, when 2K Australia shut down, so did development for this DLC. But it even had its own raid boss. So, like, look how cool this thing is. I can't believe this dlc got cancelled very sad i wish we can at least get to see that raid boss at some point in the future and the fact that they made this dlc into lilith dlc but then didn't include this raid boss and instead went with penis man 9000 aka haterax is absolutely bizarre to me now finally ending off op 75 we have got lorelei was lilith yes that's right the original design for Lilith in Borderlands 3 was going to look eerily similar to Lorelei, but when Borderlands 3 ended up releasing, it looks like they did a complete 180 and instead gave Lilith's new design to Lorelei and went for a more faithful look for Lilith instead, which I think was an amazing idea. Definitely was not a fan of the new Lilith design, so I'm glad that they changed their mind on it. All right, gamers, we've made it to OP100, and this is where things get insanely insanely bizarre we're gonna start off right here with the one we've been hinting at all video it's dying isn't canon unless it's a cutscene. if i could find the tweet from gearbox i would cash in on it and invest in it because this was the most wild thing i have ever seen i don't know if it was a joke all i know is that very recently gearbox official tweeted out from their twitter account uh replying to a fan that dying is not canon unless it's in a cutscene. This opens up so many can of worms. It is I can't even I can't even comprehend it. Like think about this. Handsome Jack, 
was dying in a cutscene. However, he doesn't actually die in a cutscene. Therefore, Handsome Jack isn't actually dead according to this theory, or, or I guess not even this theory, this, this, this canon. They, they confirmed it. The warrior. Sure, you kill the warrior, but he doesn't die in a cutscene. You hit the button, it comes down and hits the warrior, and it goes back into the lava. So I guess you could say the warrior isn't actually dead. Tyrene at the end of Borderlands 3 does, however, die in a cutscene. After you knock her down, she, all of the essence goes into Lilith. So I guess you could argue that Tyrene really is dead. This one is so bizarre because it opens up so many theories for potential returns in the future. And that's why when people say that Handsome Jack returning wouldn't make sense, I stop them dead in their tracks and say, hold on, hold on, hold on, do your research because Handsome Jack could actually be alive and it would make perfect sense according to Gearbox. But following up with an even crazier theory, we've got Tiny Tina is Moe's. This one isn't so a theory now, but more so a theory before Borderlands 3 launched. When Gearbox went and did their whole little gameplay showcase, I think it was GCX or something like that, they showed off what they were doing with the next Borderlands game in regards to shaders, texturing and whatnot, and they showed off a character model which at the time was Moe's, but they had her face obscured and Randy Pitchford made the comment about how they're purposely not trying to reveal the identity of the character, which led fans to believe that this was actually a grown-up Tiny Tina, this one was the most bizarre thing ever at the time, and what's even more bizarre about it is I think people actually believed it as well. So definitely one of the more wild things we've seen in recent memory before the launch of Borderlands 3. And yeah, just a, just a crazy theory all around. But not as crazy as the Watcher being Tyrene. This one is bizarre. So bizarre, in fact, that I was only able to find one Reddit post on this which even merely hinted at it, but since it, it became such a thing, I think it had like 30 or so upvotes, we've got to acknowledge it and, and talk about it. The Watcher being Tyrene, I don't think it makes much sense at all. Uh, I don't know why this is a theory, but it's a theory, I guess, and it's on the list. It's an OP100 because of how absolutely batshit crazy it is. Do you think the Watcher could be Tyrene? I don't think so. I don't think that would make any sense whatsoever. But yeah, we never see the Watcher in Borderlands 3, so so who knows? I'm going to say this one isn't true. But when we're at the, the, the right at the bottom of the ocean right here, how are you supposed to know what's true or false? Exhibit A, who shot Claptrap? Leading up to the launch of Borderlands 3, promotional images showed that Claptrap looks like he had some kind of bullet hole in his, his robotic suit, I guess you could say, in his body. No one could really figure out why Claptrap had been shot. I still don't think we know to this day. If anyone knows, please let me know. I've been following this one very, very closely. But yes, Claptrap had a bullet hole in him leading up to BL3. And when the game came out, there was no bullet hole in Claptrap. So was he shot? Was he not shot? People thought Claptrap was going to die leading up to Borderlands 3. I thought Claptrap was going to die leading up to Borderlands 3. But nothing actually ended up happening. So I guess this one was just amongst the other cut story stuff. But they already had the graphics, so they reused it. I don't know, but this one is definitely extremely peculiar. What's also peculiar is the Battle Pass rumors for Borderlands 3. I'm not going to dwell too much on these because we basically have the Vault Pass now, which is similar to a Battle Pass. However, at the time, there were rumors from YouTubers who I won't name that a Battle Pass was going to make its way into Borderlands 3. There was a bunch of details leaked on this apparent Battle Pass, which never actually made it into the final product. And other YouTubers also took it upon themselves to make clickbait type and concepts for this battle pass which all in all just ended up gaslighting the community and probably put a stop to some very good plans that gearbox had because as we now know the the vault pass or what, what was it the vault card is actually a very good idea and it's very fun so man i it makes me think what it would have been like back then if it didn't get put on the shelf due to all these youtubers trying to to gaslight the idea of it but then again all's well that ends well we did get the battle pass or the vault card in the end and they actually pulled it off so fair play to gearbox there the next crazy theory here is that rose is a siren this one, I think, is actually more believable than not believable. But for those of you who are unaware, at the end of DLC 3 Bounty of Blood, Rose completely shifts off screen. She's never seen again. And players think that because of the tattoos that Rose has on her, she might be a siren. 
I don't know if this one has ever been confirmed or not confirmed. I couldn't find anything about it when I searched it up. If you know if this is true or false, or hey, even if you're someone from Gearbox and you want to spill a little bit of the beans, do let us know. I think Rose would make an amazing siren. She definitely looks like a badass. She walks around like a badass. And yeah, I'm all for it, man. If Rose is a siren, then count me in. And now moving on, we've got no Invincible in Borderlands 3 for over a year. This one kind of ties into the whole Ascension Bluff Door thing, but I do want to bring this one up and put it so far down at the bottom of this iceberg, not because not a lot of people know about it, but because this is one of the craziest, dumbest, most blind ideas I think I've ever seen in the history of a Borderlands game. The decision to not put an Invincible in Borderlands 3 for over a year, I believe, single-handedly dropped at least 20% of their player base. Because when the going got tough and there were nerfs all, all over the place that people weren't happy with, even though I didn't think they were that bad, it definitely pushed people away from the game. And I think having an Invincible there could have at least slowed down that process just a little bit. But what's even more bizarre about not putting an Invincible in BO3 for over a year is that they put arms race in before they put an invincible in they actually made what seemed to be some kind of warzone battle royale ripoff instead of an invincible i don't know why why couldn't the invincible be pushed to the front of the queue i don't think we'll ever know all i know is that if i was in charge of gearbox i would be in the office and i would be hey guys this game needs to launch with an invincible at least within the first three to four months but that never happened very very sad it's at the bottom of the list because of how bizarre this is just a really really odd choice and yeah definitely deserves to be at the bottom of the list in my opinion the next thing we're going to be talking about is the cancelled dragons keep 2 dlc this one is at the bottom because there's not too much known about it and also because the idea behind this is just absolutely crazy but yes for those of you who do not know in the files of borderlands 3 there is leftover assets from a potential dragon's keep 2 dlc which never came to be this was done very 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 early on in development and there's not too much there although there is stuff like a lightning storm grenade similar to how there was in the original dragon's keep although i do have some other details that i can share with you guys on here and it's that there was some leaked areas from this apparent dlc there was going to be around four to five main missions it looked like and it also seemed like the new areas would have consisted of a mushroom town some kind of bottom of the sea area and also a desert area too which sounds absolutely insane and as i've already said there was a lightning kind of grenade there was also an ice grenade which was similar to aurelia's ice grenade there was a grenade which shot meteors and there was also a fireball grenade although i think we've already got something pretty much like that in borderlands 3 there was also going to be stuff such as new room decorations goblin enemies and res like resurrected bosses from borderlands 3 as well just an absolute crazy 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 amount of info about this dlc but at the same time there's also not a lot of info at all and finally ending off the video the borderlands iceberg the final thing i want to bring up is zane is the other doppelganger to handsome jack this one has got to be the most far-fetched but simultaneously the most sense-making theory probably on this list. There is so much proof that kind of suggests that Zayn might be the new Handsome Jack doppelganger and that he might be double, double crossing the Vault Hunters or something like that. I, this one makes my brain explode. I really, really wish I was smart enough to even comprehend what this could mean. And again, in the description down below, I'm going to leave links to videos from people like Hater Hype if you want to learn more about this theory. This was one that was basically leading up to Borderlands 3, but it did make a lot of sense. And while this has never been confirmed as, as being canonical or not or being true or false it's definitely an interesting theory nonetheless and if you're into this kind of stuff and you like that theory crafting kind of thing with borderlands lore i think this is something you might definitely get some good watch time out of or at least i hope so anyway because this video has gone on for a minute jesus christ i am so sorry this has been probably the longest borderlands video i've ever made but gamers We've made it to the end of the iceberg. I probably missed out a ton of things. I'm really sorry. I tried to fit in as much as I could and as much as I could possibly remember. If I missed stuff out, please don't sue me. Let me know what I missed in the comment section down below. And again, if you have any info on the stuff I've talked about on this iceberg list, 
please let me know. I'm definitely interested in learning more about the things on this list. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you want to make your own iceberg, feel free to make one. Tweet me on Twitter, EpicNNG. I'll go and watch your iceberg. I'm all for this kind of stuff. So thank you guys so much for watching. I really appreciate it. I'll see you in the next one.